are going to be going to our players in just a moment. They are seated. They are set up. We're ready to go. On your left on the screen there, Fevzi Ozcan versus Davide Carrera of Italy. And these two titans, as I think we called them earlier on, certainly, uh, certainly the right description, I think, of both of these players will be getting set up to go against each other. Yes, exactly that, as we are going to be going ahead and actually seeing a bit of uh, Fevzi's team and which one he opted to bring so far, of course. Both these trainers are at 2-0 and o at the current moment, so already on form from the looks of things. Fevzi, on his side of the field, does have a mouse hold, iron bundle, flutter main, king gambit, great tusk, and turtle. Right, and on the other side of the field, Davide has that Dondozo Tatsugiri combination with the Iron Moth, Fluttermane, Arcanine, and Dragonite uh, to back them up. And uh, you were talking about players that wanted a bit more of a fast offensive style, and it looks like that Davide has been really opting for that kind of play style with the Iron Moth Fluttermane combination. It makes a lot of sense because the combination uh, tends to be that the Iron Moth does have the booster energy, which uh, in this case is uh, the situation. You're able to have that additional boost in your speed where paired with Fluttermane, which is already incredibly fast, you're able to get that really cool combination of uh, the uh, Acid Spray uh, combining with either right. a Dazzling Gleam, Moonblast, Shadow Ball from the Flutter Main, being able to do even more damage. Exactly that. And we see on your screen there at the moment, Fevzi getting top 16 in the German Nationals all the way back in 2016, talking about that when uh, Fevzi was getting started and getting to the World Championships in 2019. Malmo Regional Top Cut in 2020 uh, and a Players' Cup free uh, third place finish. So uh, absolutely fantastic set of results there from Fevzi. Exactly. Over on Davide's side, we've got 2022 World's Top 8 2020 Players' Cup number two runner-up, EUIC runner-up in 2019, and the 2017 Leipzig Regionals runner-up as well. So uh, Davide really trying to go ahead and chase for the title from the looks of things. It'd be really nice to add that to his accolades. Exactly that. I, I remember actually playing Davide in the 2017 Leipzig Regional Championships. Oh. Uh, I can't remember what round it was, but he was using a uh, combination of Pokemon that were really unfamiliar at the time to great effect. On your screen now, you can see Fevzi's team. I believe that is Davide's team from the looks of things. We do have the Iron Moth. So uh, just going into, of course, the situation, we do have the updated graphic. Here we go. This is indeed Fevzi's team. It's got the combination of the Great Tusk and, uh, of course, the Mouse Hog. Not a pairing that you commonly see. I don't see an Annihilate, Ben. No, not at all. But that Mouse Hold uh, on its own, being able to support all of these Pokemon is... I, I think the, uh, a really good way of using Mousehold in this format, certainly underrated, I think. It's certainly easy to put a uh, Annihilate in combination with a Mousehold, but harder, I think, to see that you can use it with other great Pokemon. And the thing that's sticking out to me there is that Super Fang. Mm -hmm. And depending on how that Mousehold has been trained, it could be faster than the Great Tusk carrying that Focus Sash uh, and be able to launch out a Super Fang before some really powerful attacks launch out onto the field and finish the uh, opposing Pokemon off. And it's a similar situation to what we saw in combination with the Sun. You've got the Protosynthesis plus Weather, which really can be impactful, as uh, Enosh uh, did actually uh, show us and showcase in the previous set. Uh, whilst on the other hand, we do, of course, have Davide. A notable Pokemon right here, straight off the bat, of course, a Don Dodo Tatsugiri, naturally, but we do have the Iron Moth Fluttermane we did discuss. It's very hyper offensive. It has a lot of range to uh, the coverage as well. Very, very powerful, especially when you've got Fluttermane having access to that Life Orb to further boost the damage output. Uh, what I'm seeing here is that Iron Moth, Fluttermane, and Dondozo all being Terra Grass. And it looks like Davide is saying, like, hang on a second, Amoongus, <laughs> no. A <The> Brute <laughs> Bonnet, no. Don't want to have any business with your spore shenanigans going yes. off onto the field. And, uh, you know, depending on the situation, 
Uh, you can also bypass the Rage Powder mm. from those Pokemon and make sure that you're targeting into the correct slot. Really important on teams that are as offensive as these. They really, really are because I, I think we know that Amundis and Brute Bonnet, for example, can be really good at uh, determinants of Pokemon where they're able to slow down your sweepers and in this situation Davide having the very very powerful damage output coming from the Iron Moth, Fluttermane and Dondozo makes a lot of sense you want to try to protect your sweeper in order to uh, enable you to pick up those KOs without any obstruction. You know the thing I've just noticed actually you know we talk about Iron Moth, Fluttermane as a combination which it certainly is but also we're seeing that uh, Choice Scarf on the Tatsugiri so that could easily be positioned next to Iron Moth to be able to you know take some quick knockouts because the acid spray from iron moth is going to be going off first uh, and but because of that booster energy likely boosting iron moth's speed stats so mm. uh, yeah really like the way that davide's crafted the team to be m able to most likely take advantage of that speed and that acid spray I think not having Protect as well could be quite crucial if Davide does choose to bring the Dondozo Tatsugiri mm. because mm. It, instead of Protect does have a Yawn, which we know is a very good way to slow down the tempo from your opponent's side of the field. I do quite like it, actually. You have a bit of a mix of, you know that this is one of the most offensive sweepers, but you can, if for example, not up to bring the Tatsugiri, have the option to slow things down and not necessarily rely on the Commander Boost uh, being set up for the Omni Boost. Right, and, and that's the thing with uh, Dondozo Tatsugiri teams. The best players understand when to go for the Dondozo Tatsugiri combination, when to just use Dondozo, uh, less likely, of course, uh, when to use just Tatsugiri, mm. and also, you know, when to just not bring them at all into the matchup. And I think that's really what makes the mark of a great Dondozo Tatsugiri player. Because those other four slots are so flexible, mm. uh, you can really craft a team that's able to do lots of different strategies most definitely so going into this on the other hand i don't think we've discussed this as much king gambit is such a cool pokemon especially with on fevzi's side the black glasses to further enhance the damage output of dark type moves uh, in uh, we actually see a fire terror type on king gambit which is quite interesting uh what do you think would be the main crucial point of this choice of terror type over, let's say, a flying type, which may have positive synergy with that uh, great tusk going into it? It depends on the matchups that Fevzi's trying to target here. I think King Gambit is probably more likely wanting to target down the uh, hard trick room uh, sort of matchups. Teams like Alex Soto are used in. Uh, the Liverpool Regional Championships, albeit in Series 1, similar kind of construct here, uh, where you can keep the Dark type to avoid the expanding force from Pokemon like Armor Rouge, but then on crucial turns, you can change yourself into a Fire type mm. and resist those Armor Cannons coming in. Uh, Texts like that are really important in those sort of matchups because it's all about how much damage those Trick Room teams can launch out onto the field while the Trick Room is up most definitely the case as ladies and gentlemen and everyone else we have the leads for round three davide is going to be starting off with the iron moth and flutter main we already see the booster energy coming into play will heighten the speed on that iron moth allowing it to potentially outspeed this flutter main uh whilst on the other hand we've got um uh, fevzi with the great tusk and mouse hold right and uh, really offensive lead coming out of the bat from uh, Davide and a little bit of more defensive lead, even though that Great Tusk is going to be putting on piles of pressure. Unfortunately, you know, there is the Dazzling Gleam to take in a, into account from that Fluttermane, and it is going to be able to bypass the Follow Me. So Fevzi has a choose here whether to go for a Follow Me or to use his Mouse Hold a little bit more effectively and try to get some, uh, get into a bit of a better position. It is quite tough because we do know that the Great Tusk does actually have Focus Sash. Let's see if it comes in play as no, it's just going to be a double protect right now. Just wanting to maybe scout out to see what Davide is actually going to try to go for. Which Pokemon uh, he would like to lock down into. We see the Acid Spray trying to target down that Great Tusk. Makes a lot of sense. You want to be able to at least both break the Focus Sash as well as uh, KO the Great Tusk with the Dazzling Gleam immediately after. Right, and you know, no surprise there, a Dazzling Gleam comes out. Great Tusk isn't a Pokemon that's known for its high special defense capabilities. Uh, Mousehold 
with the friend card is going to be able to, you know, do a little bit to help that out. But uh, Flutter Blade, with the, especially with the Life Orb, is a little bit too powerful. The impactful thing here, I think, is that the Mouse Hold can uh, follow me away the Acid Spray coming out from the Iron Moth. And so the Great Tusk isn't able to go down in one, uh, at least on this turn. And you kind of got to be careful. Flutter Mane's not known for its physical bulk. Iron Moth is four times weak uh, to Earthquakes or Headlong Rushes uh, coming out from here. And the difficulty is that there is no Earthquake. There is, in fact, Ice Spinner mm. on this Great Tusk. Which kind of makes sense why you don't opt to go for the King Gambit flying type because there's no need. You don't have the spread ground type right. in order to have that negative synergy going on. So uh, being able to actually see the Great Tusk right now opts to go for that ground terror type. Mouse Hold, on the other hand, opts to go for the Follow Me, wants to make sure that we redirect any sort of damage coming that way, which will be the Asses Bray also going to drop its special defense down to negative two. Dazzling Gleam, however, not <laughs> dealing that much damage at all onto that a Great Tusk. Does pick up the KO on the Mouse Hold, however, but we are going to be seeing what uh, move this Great Tusk goes for. It is the Headlong Rush. Tigers down the Flutter Main, and of course, no Focus Sash there. We know it's Life Orb. It will pick up the KO. Yeah, nice, easy KO there. And, uh, you know, Flutter Main going back to David, uh, waiting to come out in potentially a different set. Uh, I, I like the targeting there from Fevzi. It's a really difficult. Uh, thing when you're playing down Pokemon that are so offensively driven. That Iron Moth, even with the Acid Spray, is still going to be doing quite a lot of damage to Pokemon on Fevzi's side of the field. It does have access to Fiery Dance, and it does have access uh, to um, Energy Ball as well. So there's a lot of great coverage there to still be able to put pressure on Fevzi's side of the field, but that Dazzling Gleam coming out from the Fluttermane on Davide's side of the field is just too oppressive, I think, to leave alone in this early game. So really like how both players are, you know, taking that offensively uh, driven uh, team archetype and piloting them very, very well. And we're going to be seeing the Iron Moth switch out now for the Tatsugiri. Makes a lot of sense. You want to be able to get that Commander Boost going as Tatsugiri hops straight into <laughs> Don Dozo's mouth to give it a plus two in all of its stat stages right now, making it such a juggernaut of a Pokemon uh, with such great damage output potential. However, we know that uh, most Flutter mains do actually outspeed these Don right. Dozos even after the boost, so it'll be quite curious Ooh. and interesting to see what this Flutter main goes for. But <laughs> Fevzi bringing in the sun, giving the additional boost to that Flutter main in its special attack. This is going to hit really hard. Goes oh, nearly mm. a two hit KO, which is very strong onto a Omni boost. Oh my Dozo. god, wow, what a survival and so much damage, even in the sun. That's an incredible turn there for Fevzi. The sun coming in does two jobs. It uh, both boosts up the Flutter Main uh, and gives it an extra special layer of special attack investment alongside the choice specs that it's carrying that are further boosting its special attacks. But also, like, I can't believe that it's that Flutter Main survived the wave crash. That Dondozo is boosted up to two stages of increased attack. Yep. And the sun just allowed it to just hang on oh. with a sliver. The wave crash recoil yes. allows this Moonblast to take a knockout here. And Dondozo, within two turns, goes back to Davide. And it is just the Tatsugiri on the field feeling a little bit drowsy. A little bit drowsy, yawning with this cute little mouth right now, but I think uh, you couldn't have scripted that interaction any better if you were <laughs> on Fevzi's side. I think being able to perfectly place that situation where Wave Crash Recoil will actually put it within the Moonblast range was really, really cool to see. Yawn makes a lot of sense. You don't want to try to go into with a Fire-type move into the Tatsugiri, as it does resist by four times. Um, trying to slow things down. We've got Iron Moth. David is already down to his final two Pokemon, so Fevzi really needs to control the tempo right now. He does, and this is a tough situation. Iron Moth is really a Pokemon that uh, is able to outspeed Fluttermane depending on how it's trained. Uh, Fluttermanes that carry choice specs are typically a little bit slower, a little bit more bulky, um, and aren't able to 
uh, go for that damage early doors. We see that that Tatsugiri carrying the Choice Scarf is going to be fast enough to pick up a knockout with that Muddy Water. Ooh, Fiery Dance, an attempt to potentially not only deal a bit of damage, but get a special attack boost. No boost there, as there was a chance for that. Yawn does now go straight into the Iron Moth. So uh, gets a bit of recovery as well, Torkoal. Makes a lot of sense, as we are going to be seeing the Tatsugiri curly form uh, being put to sleep right now because of the previous Yawn uh, targeting that slot. And Great Tusk does have access to protect. And I did want to make a point. Don Dozo was stuck in that situation previous turn without a protect. Right. Because it does have leftovers, maybe could have tried to recover a bit of HP to get outside of the range of being KO'd from a Moonblast. Probably not likely. I mean, with the amount of recoil that that, uh, uh, that Wave Crash did onto the Don Dozo. But I really like the end game, and you alluded to it earlier, the Fevs is going for here. Uh, the Tatsugiri is already asleep. It's got a guaranteed sleep turn uh, coming this turn. A Protect coming out from the Great Tusk means that that Iron Moth is going to be going to sleep next turn. And of course, no reason for Fevzi to launch out any damage, especially not looking at the uh, access to the moves that Fevzi have, because it's only Flamethrower as an offensive move onto that Torkoal. So Great Tusk has a lot, got a lot of work to be doing to be able to make sure it's knocking out both of Davide's Pokemon uh, before they wake up. And I think there is a chance for the Tatsugiri, of course, now going into uh, the current turn to uh, stay, uh, to actually wake up. And we did see it lock into Muddy Water. Right. I think uh, Davide recognized his potential win con. Maybe if he could uh, get a hit off, of course, but maybe get an accuracy drop onto this mm. great task. That mm. would really meddle with Fevzi's plan. Yeah, because if you miss a headlong rush at any point onto that Iron Moth, it's going to be really, really difficult to uh, win the game with just Torkoal if it's able to knock out that uh, Great Tusk. But no Pokemon waking up this turn. Headlong rush coming into Tatsugiri Ooh. is easily enough to pick out the knockout with that Protosynthesis boost that Great Tusk gets from Torkoal's son. And Tatsugiri is going to be going back to Devide. And no wake up here from the Iron Moth, just taking a little bit of damage from that Flamethrower coming out from Fevzi's Torkoal. And this is a bit of a precarious position. We do see the Sun no longer is on field. It has expired, which does mean that this uh, Iron Moth's Fiery Dance will not be dealing as much damage. We know that Great Tusk, like you mentioned as well, is not known to have good bulk in its special defense. However, do you expect the Iron Moth to wake oh! up? Oh! <laughs> right on cue! You, you couldn't have called that one better. <laughs> no! Energy Ball coming out into the Great Tusk is enough to pick up a oh. one-hit knockout. The Great Tusk with its special defense drop from the previous turn's headlong rush. And Davide must be really happy to see that. But Yawn coming out from the Torkoal is going to be able to put the Iron Moth straight back to sleep. And with no moves that Davide has on his side of the field to be able to boost up that Iron Moth. It is down to the Torkoal to be able to finish off this game. And man, it's got a lot of work to do. It does. Uh, word of advice to all our, of our lovely viewers, uh, maybe get a refreshment or two because we may <laughs> be in here for a while. However, it makes a lot of sense with what Davide has gone for there. Opted to go for the Acid Spray. Makes sense. But we're in the situation where the Torkoal is recovering HP at the end of each turn, and now the Iron Moth will be put to sleep. So it's a bit of a sluggish uh, end of this uh, game one. No Gastrodon mm. in sight. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes a lot of sense, and it's not exactly predetermined at this situation. No, I mean, it's. Uh, I feel it's likely that the Iron Moth is going to be able to take this, looking at the damage coming out from the Flamethrower on the Torkoal, but we'll have to see how the sleep turns interact. We've also got a little bit of recovery from the leftovers coming out from Torkoal. The thing that's going to be really big is whether or not uh, Davide can get off an Acid Spray onto the Torkoal, lower its special defense by two stages, and even though everything other than the acid spray is resisted it's going to be ramping up that damage uh, so fevzi's got to play this cleverly make sure that he doesn't take any more damage than he needs to and also gets the most amount of leftovers recovery while keeping that iron moth asleep exactly as of course we do see the flamethrower is trying its best to whittle down this iron moth which does not have access to any sort of recovery means unlike the uh, little fire tortoise pokemon <laughs> um but yes it, it makes a lot of sense in this position i think it was very crucial to make note of course of that turn one wake up from the iron moth in order to go and enable itself to pick up the ko onto the great task with the energy ball 
Right, and it looks like Iron Moth stayed asleep a little bit longer this Tiny time, uh, uh, which is great position for Fevzi to be in. Nearly all of the HP back on that Torkoal, and I believe, I, if I've counted correctly, which I may not have done, this is the turn that Iron Moth is guaranteed to be waking up here. <laughs> and here we go, it's woken up. We've called it out twice. twice. I think mm. yours was a little bit more of a, a, a prediction than mine, <laughs> maybe. But uh, yeah, he, he's going to be awake now. But all of these turns are really impactful, right? Because that extra turn of leftovers recovery, while it is only a 16th of your health yeah. uh, that's coming back, mm. you need every single one of those that you can get because these acid sprays are going to add up. They really, really will. But in this situation, of course, we see that Acid Spray will be dropping uh, Tortoise Special Defense down to negative two. It's not known to have very good Special Defensive Bolt. However, of course, as expected, Yawn does go into the slot. We're going to be expecting the subsequent Protect right now. Makes a lot of sense. Tortoise theoretically, should have this, but it's not all guaranteed. You know, there's RNG to take into account, which is uh, very decisive and it can be very influencing of match outcome. Right, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a case of uh, these these Pokemon, when how long Iron Moth stays asleep. If it does stay asleep as long as it can uh, in these sort of scenarios, there's a potential that Fevzi's gonna come out on top, but I'm, I'm, I'm really expecting the Iron Moth to be able to bring it back here uh, and allow uh, Davide to win because those flamethrowers are really just not doing lots of damage. Is that a critical hit? Yes, yes it is. Good Absolutely. <laughs> we saw just that little bit more damage. <laughs> uh, very. That actually could be quite big now because mm -hmm. it puts the Iron Moth a little bit closer in range. One thing I do want to talk about while these turns are playing out and this Iron Moth is taking a little bit of a nap mm -hmm. is the decision to go after the Tatsugiri as opposed to the Iron Moth. Yes, because I think we knew that Tatsugiri was locked into Muddy Water. Maybe there was some sort of fear of the expectation of Sun, uh, which will have, uh, of course, ran out a couple of turns later, which it did. And maybe that could have led up in a situation where Davide could have even potentially picked up KOs and won the game mm. if the Tatsugiri was allowed that range. Yeah, and it looks like with the this last flamethrower and Fevzi, uh, Fevzi's Torkoal getting back up to full health, it's probably going to be the Torkoal that's now going to be taking the game. Uh, Iron Moth, unfortunately, has been quite tired coming into this event, clearly. <laughs> you know, he's probably done quite a lot of work in the previous rounds, getting Davide his wins that he's had <laughs> so far. As well, do you know what? I'm going to take one game. I'm going to have a little nap. Torkoal's, Torkoal's just, you know, yawning away. And, uh, you know, it's going to be probably coming out fresh for the later later games. There's so much Iron Moth can carry. Um, so in this scenario, uh, it is likely that, of course, the Torkoal will be winning this set. So a bit of a long one uh, for the end of that game one. But it makes a lot of sense. You need to try to ensure you play as safe as possible as long as it is going to make you reach the win condition that you, of course, want to establish. Right. And, you know... There's no reason for Fevzi to go for any reads here. You get the Yawn out. You know that the Iron Moth is going to be going to sleep the next turn. You know that the Iron Moth is going to be uh, taking one more flamethrower. If it survives this and there's an Acid Spray that comes out uh, next turn, uh, if the Ooh. Iron Moth gets a one-turn wake, just, <laughs> just <laughs> there, just surviving on just a little bit. Now that Torkoal's at minus four stages of special defense, mm -hmm. There's a chance looking at the damage that's already been done, I think. What's the move that can hit the most right now? It, it may just be an acid spray, if I'm completely honest, because it's neutral. Fiery mm. Dance um, is, of course, a fire type. It'll be very close. But in this situation, I think Davide needs to hope for a critical hit as well as a turn one wake somehow. Right. I think in the sun, Fiery Dance would be the one. Yes. Uh, but looking at this and... We're doing a, a couple of quick calculations quick. in my head. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't trust them back at home if I were you, but... Uh, poker math. <laughs> poker math. Um, yeah, I think Acid Spray is probably the one that's most likely to uh, do the most damage here. Ooh, and we're going to be seeing the terrestrialization into the grass type Ooh, right yeah, now. actually, I didn't even consider that, that uh, Davide hasn't yet... Uh, gone into its terror type and the Iron Moth waking up, getting the energy ball, uh, getting that extra same type attack bonus on the grass type energy ball is going to be more Ooh. damage, but not enough to pick up the KO. Oh, oh, oh. Torkoal going back to the flamethrower wow. and 
Fevzi winning that match. An unfortunate early turn, early wake up turn there with the iron off of Fevzi, but he stood strong and came back and got the win. What an incredible strategy from Davide's side there. Being uh, able to save the terrestrialization to the point where you want to utilize your highest hitting move on your Pokemon. In this case, oh, we believe that, uh, of course, Energy Ball was indeed that move. Fiery Dance, at the cost of being slightly lower in base power, it does have that secondary chance, of course, to uh, en further enhance its special attack. Exactly that. Just that little bit higher power of a move and the access to that Grass Terrestrialization makes all of them effectively equivalent in terms of damage, but that energy ball is just, just sneaks out there. Unfortunate for Davide that it didn't quite pick up the knockout. Uh, with a couple of other t uh, attacks weaved in there, could have been different. I really like the way that he saved it right till the end because, of course, you don't want to be a grass type when something's hitting the flamethrower button in your direction. <laughs> no, most definitely not. And it was quite interesting to see with that slither of health, uh, maybe Davida did take into consideration, right, okay, I may be able to survive just with a tiny bit of hit points mm. left. Mm. Maybe I could somehow bring this back. Turn one, uh, wake up as well as that critical hit was the only way out, but you got to play to your win cons. Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, a lot of respect to both of these players to play that out. Both of them did have a good opportunity to win that game. I think Devode was a little bit unfortunate with the amount of turns that IMOF stayed asleep. But equally, to get into that position, Iron Moth had to wake up early. So, yeah. you know, these things do balance out over a set. And, uh, you know, not to say that uh, one player deserved to win over another because I think they both played excellent games in that match. Yep. Uh, you know, it, it just ended up that the Torco with those with that leftovers item was just so had so much sustain uh, that it was able to hold on right till the end. Yeah, I mean, mono attack Torco uh, with a potential support move such as, of course, Yawn, Helping Hand Protect, is a really, really cool play onto a uh, archetype of a team such as Protosynthesis plus um, the Sun Weather as well. Right, and so going into game two now, I'm trying to think of how I would adapt if I was Davide because that was such a close set. Mm. Um, but I think it was really that Don Dozo Tatsugiri combination that just didn't quite make it. You, you, the, the Flutter main on Fevzi's side of the field, lasting with seven hit points, looks like it could have been uh, one of those situations where uh, you know, on another day, Don Dozo takes the knockout, and that would have changed the game up completely. Oh, talking about changing the game up completely, we've got a tiny bit of a change from Fevzi's side, actually bringing the King Gambit now onto the field, as opposed to what we had previously seen was the Great Tusk and Mousehold versus Iron Moth and Fluttermane. Right, and I'm wondering now if the uh, boosted by the black glasses on the King Gambit, whether a combination of Helping Hand and the Sucker Punch mm. will be enough to knock out this Fluttermane in one shot. Right, my instinct says it will, uh, and that's something that, uh, that Davide is going to have to be really careful of because it's going to be hard in that sort of situation to just go for the aggressive plays that we saw in game one and try and take the advantage that way. But of course, sometimes you can get the read going and, uh, you know, Give yourself an early lead coming into game two. Yeah, and I think this may be a situation where Fevzi may have expected the adaptation from Davide's side, maybe bring Arcanine in as a lead, and want to try to catch that Intimidate out with the Defiant uh, boost from the King Gambit. However, we're going to be seeing the Dondozo switch in for the Fluttermane helping hand assistance from the Mousehold onto the King Gambit. And Iron Moth, of course, protecting. What is this King Gambit going to do? Sucker Punch, but of course it's going to fail because we don't know, first off, which slot it actually targeted, and second, because of the Protect on Iron Moth and the switch in from the Dondozo. Right, no target attacking anything, so Sucker Punch unfortunately does fail, but would have been a priority attack if either Iron Moth or Fluttermane was going to be attacking that turn. So I like the way that David has played this because now you've got some mind games going on. That Iron Moth is on the field next to Dondozo. Dondozo, of course, can summon in a Tatsugiri, so to speak. Yep. Uh, and that means that the Iron Moth slot is a little bit less easy to target in these sort of scenarios. But of course, with the Super Fang on Mousehold, it could be putting a lot of pressure onto that Dondozo this turn. Only if it is, of course, allowed to move, as we're going to be seeing the Tatsugiri 
does come back onto the field right now as opposed to the mirrored game one going into game two we do see the boost coming into play onto onto this don dozo uh we feel like this is likely going to be going into the mouse hold ben what are your thoughts i think so the mouse hold is something that's a real problem here for davide but the super fang outspeeding the don dozo great great ability to do so here earthquake coming out from the don dozo is going to be hitting onto both targets but King Gambit so, so defensively wow. orientated that it just takes it like an absolute champ. Assurance going to be doing double damage because it went after the Super Fang. Yes. And so is able to bring uh, the Dondozo down to a pretty low uh, amount of health. And we've got an interesting situation right now. This Dondozo, as we of course know, does not have Protect, but it does have access to Yawn. Uh, Davide has to try to read into this whether there's an expected helping hand plus sucker punch coming out in right. order to enable the King Gambit to uh, out prioritize the Don Dozo, maybe pick up a KO if possible. But uh, Davide may read it into that and actually opt to go for the very passive Yawn. So, very, very crucial turn here. Right. And, you know, we know that that Don Dozo hasn't got the ability to protect, but King Gambit does in this position. I really like the protect there. Just lowering this Don Dozo's health a little bit more. Super Fang oh. doing half of the damage possible onto that Don Dozo. So while it's unlikely, in fact, impossible with the leftovers for Mousehold to be able to knock out the Don Dozo with a Super Fang, you do keep it under control and you do stop that leftovers recovery mm. from healing it up to an a, a, a range that you can't deal with. Yeah, in this uh, situation, I, I guess Fevzi may be motivated just to uh, stay in onto the Earthquake right here. Go for the Assurance combination with that Super Fang to guarantee pick up a KO mm. on some Don Dozo because we know it can't protect. And Davide now trying to opt to go for that Yawn does sort of give away a bit of his strategy in anticipation of the read of what is Fevzi going to do. He may try to go for the Sucker Punch, but he called it out. Unfortunately failed. We are going to be seeing the Mouse Hold go for the Follow Me. Right, and Earthquake coming out onto the field. So not falling for the follow me whatsoever. That's probably going to knock out the mouse hold here, but King Gambit survives on just a sliver. Knocking out the mouse hold, Fevz going back to Fevzi and allowing him to get another Pokemon into the fray. But that Dondozo just surviving with a sliver of health. And I like this for Fevzi. I really do too. Yeah, because you've got the uh, ability for Fluttermane to be coming in here, and we know from game one that that's going to be outspeeding that Dondozo. This is such a cool interaction of what's going on right here because uh, this will likely go ahead and uh, allow for free damage to be dealt onto that Tatsugiri once the Dondozo does get uh, knocked out. So being able to do that in this situation makes a lot of sense. I think just Fevzi needs to take into consideration which move do I want to go ahead and actually lock myself into as, of course, this is a choice spec Fluttermane, which just deals so much damage. Right, and the, the question you've got to ask is, you know, do you knock it out in the move blast, which is, you know, really good against the Tatsugiri that's going to be jumping out of Don Dozo's mouth there, or do you lock into something like Shadow Ball because uh, you've got, you know that there's an Iron Moth sitting in the back waiting for, uh, waiting in the wings, so to speak, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's going to be resisting the fairy type moves. As we are going to be seeing, Don Dozo does does get taken down. Tatsugiri pops outside of the mouth, and we see, of course, very good damage being dealt onto the Tatsugiri there with Assurance, not even needing to have any sort of damage dealt onto it previously mm. to double its damage output. No, and now there's a combination of Iron Moth and Fluttermane in the back. We know that that Tatsugiri is carrying the Choice Scarf and only has offensive moves. That's going to make this King Gambit really effective in the end game because you know you can pick up an easy knockout mm -hmm. into the Tatsugiri. At this stage, though, you have to think about whether Davidia has to think about whether or not to go for an attack or to switch out a particular slot against this Sucker Punch. Mm. Because if you manage to do that successfully for a few turns in a row, you might be able to knock out this King Gambit and remove the Sucker Punch problem from the field. I'm not even sure if Fluttermane can, it might be a chance that it could survive if it terrestrializes into the Grass Terror right. from Sucker Punch right. too. So I'm not sure if this may be uh, in effect. It will depend because this King Gambit, of course, is boosted by the uh, Black Glasses, uh, meaning it is even more powerful. It does hit for neutral uh, though, but we shall find out as this is a terrestrialization, but it is indeed, and that's going to be the Fluttermane going for the Grass-type Terror there, and, uh, you know, not going to make an impact into 
uh, the uh, Sucker Punch, but may avoid some damage from, say, an Iron Head coming out from the King Gambit if Fevzi so choose to. Also from the Shadow Ball that we know is in play uh, and Fevzi is locked into at the moment, you definitely don't want to be weak to that particular move if you're a Flutter Main at this stage. But it looks like Flutter Main Flutter Main's going Terra <laughs> all around. Uh, both Flutter Mains do terrestrialize. Davide's Grass type over on Fevzi's side. We've got the Steel type. Muddy Water does come out. We know, however, Flutter Main is actually very bulky in its special defense. It does manage to evade the Muddy Water and the Dazzling Gleam because of the Steel terrestrialization there. It's doing absolute minimal damage uh, just for nothing, essentially. They're wasting Davide's uh, Flutter Main's move, but we do see Shadow Ball. It does terrestrialize. So being able to avoid the super effective Shadow Ball does allow at least some riddle room for Davide's uh, strategy to still be implemented. But Sucker Punch is still such a threat. It is. And, and this is so hard, right? You, you have to figure out what slot the Sucker Punch is going into because I, I think if I was Fevzi, I'd be Sucker Punching regardless on this, uh, on this turn mm -hmm. uh, because both Pokemon so low you definitely want to be taking out a knockout regardless of what Pokemon goes for an, offense, uh, uh, an offensive move. Fluttermane does have the opportunity to protect on Davide's side of the field. Tatsugiri has the opportunity to switch. So you can fail one, both ways round, and it's down to Davide to find the line that allows his Pokemon to, to survive the turn. Let us see which slot was targeted with a Sucker Punch. Uh, well, actually, that will not matter right now because we have actually seen the Tatsugiri switch out for the Iron Moth and the Flutter Main over on Davide's side has opted to go for Protect. However, the Flutter Main on Fevzi's side is going to be going for the Shadow Ball there, dealing really good amount of damage. Uh, there is no booster energy to take in con into consideration from what I uh, remember because it has been previously consumed from right. turn one. It has, and uh, great Shadow Ball there doing 50% to Iron Moth. That's going to put a lot of pressure on the field there. I do think that it's likely this Iron Moth is the fastest Pokemon on the field right now, aside from Fluttermane on Davide's side of the field. So you've got to be really clever if you're Fevzi as to who you're going to be targeting with that Sucker Punch and who you're going to be suppressing, because again, both slots can switch out. Technically, you can avoid Sucker Punch damage by going for a double protect. Uh, there's no reason that, that you can't. It's if you predict that only Sucker Punch is going into that slot, doesn't matter if you fail, the Sucker Punch still doesn't go through. Exactly, as we are going to be seeing Iron Moth do just that. It does, of, of course, for the Protect. Sucker Punch, however, does go into the correct slot. So, Fevzi, you can see him exhilarated with the <laughs> successful hit there. Does pick up the KO onto the Fluttermane on Davide's side. All of a sudden, right now, Davide is at a three versus two deficit and it's gonna have to try to bring this one back in order to avoid getting uh, his first loss of the tournament right we haven't seen the fourth pokemon for fevzi's side of the field but that tatsugiri holding the choice scarf we know that it's going to be knocked out by the sucker punch there's no reason for fevzi to do anything you know fancy here um so we're just going to see the uh sucker punch i think going into the tatsugiri oh. davide knows he's in a a, a really tough spot and uh, he's going for the forfeit there. Fevzi taking the match two and oh. Wow. Uh, of what was a actually very close set, you know? Right. It's one of those sets where you see two and oh and you're like, oh, right, okay, it must have been a route. It must have been really, really in favor of one of the trainer as opposed to the other, or they maybe played uh, outstandingly well. But we saw in game one, it was really just down to the most minor of details right. and game two however we did see there was a lot more uh switch play from fevzi's side really good targeting that we saw you know mm. it's very tough when you've got the situation where you've got davide very well veteran experienced player can understand the different degrees of reads that are needed really switching things up from his side of the field trying to do his best to avoid all of the pressure coming out from fevzi's side Right, and you have to, in that position, get it right every single every turn. Every single turn. Every single turn, because if you get it wrong at any stage, you're going to be opening yourself up to a really difficult spot. That's what we saw. Uh, but they got it right a few times yeah. before uh, Fevzi managed to get it right and mm. be able to knock that Pokemon out. So, yeah, really, really close, uh, close set. 
um, to have between these two players and definitely a showcase of what two great players can achieve when they bring their A game to these matches. Exactly. So uh, we see, of course, Fevzi has been able to go ahead and clinch his third victory of today, uh, taking him up to 3-0. and oh. Of course, we will be having a uh, winner's interview shortly with him as well. So uh, being that the case, of course, let's just talk a bit about the matchup. Do we feel that game two, uh, there could have been more that uh, Davide could have actually gone and done? Because we saw there was a bit of a change up. King Gambit was the main change mm, from Fetsy's mm. side, right? He led with it. That could have led really well into an Arcanine. But Davide stuck to his strategy from game one, brought the exact same leads, Iron Moth and that uh, Flutter Main. However, wasn't able to capitalize so much off of the Dondozo getting the Omni boost. Right, exactly. And I think that King Gambit quite literally sat on the field for <laughs> the whole of game two. Yeah. I, I want to call out the Mousehold on uh, that particular point because it was the Mousehold's friend guard that allowed the King Gambit to survive those two earthquakes yep. and be, you know, even though it was like 11, 13 HP, whatever it was, um, you know, that's all it needed because mm. all it needed to do was put that offensive pressure on yeah. uh, when when you get to a position where pokemon are like half health or below yeah. a black glasses sucker punch from king gambit is definitely something that you don't want to be staring down at all no um and i think you know there was a turn there where maybe a wave crash would have done a little bit more damage mm. and allowed the earthquake to pick up the ko if uh davide decided to wave crash first mm -hmm and then Earthquake to kind of finish off the uh, King Gambit. Yep. But the way that he played it and the way that Fevzi reacted to it is mm -hmm. after the first Earthquake, yep. there was a follow me. There was. And that stopped the second wave crash yes. from being able to pick up the KO. Yeah, and uh, that's the sort of intricate details that we're talking about. A lot of mind games, uh, generally speaking, of course in VGC, especially in this format, but uh, between two veteran-like players like this, there's so many different levels to it, but being able to see it is always such a treat and it's such a joy because uh, we're behind the caster desk, you know, we're commentating <laughs> about the matches, but we are loving the action going on and it's really a cool a drive to sort of try to invest yourself even further into competitive play. I just, I'm really excited to have seen an Iron Moth on the screen. <laughs> like, personally yeah. speaking, Volcarona was one of my favorite Pokemon from the black and white era. Yeah, yeah. And it's so nice to see that it's got a little bit more love coming into Scarlet and Violet with its yeah. past and uh, past future. and future forms. Yes. Future being that Iron Moth, of course. It was mm -hmm. like one of my favorite designs. <laughs> so coming and seeing it doing uh, really respectable work. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it nearly was able to knock out that Torkoal in the end game of game one. And yeah. uh, you know, if it wasn't quite so sleepy, it would have been able to do so. Uh, it was very, very close to doing it. So uh, really nice to see, you know, that being applied in a in a competitive way and seeing it perform yeah. so, so well. I mean, and that's sort of the, the uh, additional dimension of having booster energy items in play, right? With the new pa Paradox Pokemon, you're able to get that heightened stat immediately on the right. field. You don't need to meet the prerequisite uh, conditions of, let's say, for example, for Protosynthesis, that would be the Sun Weather, which we've already seen a lot of archetypes basing the Weather Core with the Protosynthesis Paradox Pokemon Core. Mm -hmm. uh, then you've got Electric Terrain for the Quark Drive ability, which at the moment, I think the only viable-ish a Pokemon or actually Pokemon that gets access to uh, Electric Surge, which naturally brings the Electric Terrain onto the field the moment that it uh, lands in it, is Pincurchin. Yeah, and <laughs> I'm sorry, um, Pincurchin. I think I, I, I think a lot of players are missing Tapu Koko. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it would really, be nice like, right now. It would have been, would have been, it would be so impactful in the meta game. There's yeah. not as so many Electric Pokemon that are really good, and unfortunately, Pincurchin falls into uh, that category, at least from a competitive. Uh, standpoint, I think it's a really cool designed Pokemon. It is, it's cool. um, and, you know, one that I really enjoyed finding <laughs> in the Sun and Moon uh, games. But, you know, it's it's uh, just unfortunately not quite as a as a presence as something like mm -hmm. Torkoal, mm -hmm. which we don't see a lot in this format. But well, when we do see it, yeah. it usually is providing that heavy offensive mm -hmm. uh, damage uh, priority in. Yeah. Uh, in trick room conditions. So mm -hmm. really nice to see that coming in a, a little bit more of what we would call a good stuff core or yes. a, a more balanced, balanced. composition. That's, uh, exactly, because right now the total that we've so far featured on the stream 
have not been the high offensive trick room sweepers. They've been more of the supportive enabling sets, which has been quite nice. We've seen, I believe, during the Sword and Shield era of Dynamax, uh, at some point there was the hyper offensive call, which tends to happen at the start of every format, right? Definitely. We've got the hard trick room team. Tortor's your reliable trick room sweeper. Just you see there, like, oh yes, please come here. No. <laughs> <laughs> that usually happens, but then as the meta starts developing, you're able to get that sort of stall support um, you know, core of, uh, or set, should I say, for the Tortol, you've got the Yawn access. Yawn is mm. so good. Uh, I think we've been seeing it because of Dynamax, it really flared up right. in popula uh, popularity, didn't it? Well, that was the thing is, you know, you had three turns of Dynamax and, uh, you know, you want to be able to Yawn and stop that Dynamax from being very effective. So, yeah. you know, great to see that coming back in this series. We're going to be able to talk a little bit about that with our winner of the previous round, Fevzi. So we're going to be going to the couch now where we have an interview with your winner from round three, Fevzi Ozkan. Hello, Pokemon trainers. I am joined by the winner of that amazing round three match, Fevzi. I mean, you are no stranger to these winners' interviews. It's been it's been a while since I've been able to interview you, but definitely you are well known. You've just survived against a Dondozo matchup that I know every player hates to see in team preview. How do you feel now? Relieved that one's over? Oh, absolutely. You know, going into the tournament, we were like, how many Dondozos are we going to face? Because we don't have the best matchup. You know, if I feel like if you want to have a good Dondozo matchup, you need haze because those Dondozos nowadays come in every form and shape. You know, they can have, they can be Terra Steel, Heavy Slam, they can be Terra Blast, they can be Fissure with Yawn, they can be Body Press, and they have all, like, they could have all the different um, partners, you know, like, everything works basically. And we were like, okay, we don't have haze on our team, but what if we just make our Pokemons bulky enough <laughs> so they can survive whatever comes? And we had this idea that we put Torkoal on our team because Wave Crush is its strongest move. We're like, okay, the plus two earthquake is not going to kill us, right? So we are like, we're just going to EV everything to survive plus two Wave Crash. And as we saw in game one, our Fluttermane <laughs> just did that in Sun. I mean, that's the thing. There's been so many kind of evolutions of Dondozo from Series 1 to Series 2, and then suddenly it's like Grass Terror, then Steel Terror, then Flying Terror. It's got so many different things. And I have to say, I did not expect Torkoal to be the Pokemon of choice against a Dondozo. And I mean, Torkoal was the little Torkoal that could in that Game 1. I mean, approaching that Game 1, how do, you, how do you start to even process what is happening and the, figure out what that win condition was? Because, you know, it's a difficult situation where neither Pokemon can deal a lot to each other. So how do you kind of keep your composure and then face that situation? You know, in Game 1, I mean, I saw, because we're playing open team sheets, I saw that the Dondozo has a Terra type that is weak to Torkoal. So I was like, okay, my, to my Torkoal is super bulky and it has like sky high defensive stats, so even if it gets an earthquake off, I can still protect, you know, recover a little bit with leftovers, and then it's not even be gonna be a two hit. And with Moss Hold, it's even like it's even bulkier because of Frank Guard. So even if it decides to terrestrialize, I can still do damage with Flamethrower. And yeah, Torkoal just worked out super well. <laughs> it's it. It supports Fluttermane super well with the Proto Synthesis. Yep. Um, it's a hard one. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, you know, I was okay. If I'm not going to do enough damage, I still have the Helping Hand on Torgo, which it learned, I think, this generation. Mm -hmm. And normally Torgo is just standing around, not doing enough damage if it's outside of Trick Room. But we have Yawn, we have Helping Hand. It sets the sun, it protects its partners, da mitigates the um, damage. And, yeah, I felt like. For a Dondozo matchup, it was manageable, <laughs> to say the least. I think you're right, though. We're so used to seeing Torkoal in Trick Room teams, and you're not actually the first one we've been able to showcase on the broadcast. It seems like a lot of players have picked up Torkoal coming into this event, which I find surprising, having come off the back of you know the Oceania International Championships where Pelipper and Palafin got the win at the end. Yeah. Were you not nervous that you know more rain modes were being picked up coming into this event? I mean... I mean, I could be, to be honest, but you know, like the Pokemon are so bulky and I, I feel like if I can preserve my weather in the back, Polyphon is not going to do enough damage. And like rain teams usually like to lead Polyphon. I feel like it limits them a little bit. Um, and I can just have, 
Yeah, exactly. And like, I can lead my Torkoal, and if they lead, if they lead the Pelipa, because I'm slower, I'm gonna get the weather advantage, and then I, I'm just, I can't just switch out, switch in, and obviously Rain is, it just won the uh, the Oceania Championships, yeah. but I feel like Torko is just doing an amazing job. <laughs> Torko might be back to stay a little bit, you know, it's reigning supreme at the minute. Just speaking about your team in general, obviously we talked about Torko a lot, but there are some other great Pokemon on your team as well. We've kind of coined, looking at the Paradox Pokemon, the big three in the form of Fluttermane, Great Tusk and Iron Bundle. And you had all three on your team, I believe. Why are they so good at the moment? You know, what drew you to have all three on your team? Why are they so valuable in the current meta? I feel like they're just so slow. They're just so fast. They just do so much damage and they can be so bulky. And I feel like if you're not running them, you're missing out. You know, you're like giving yourself a disadvantage that doesn't have to be. And we tried to come up with different Pokemon for the longest time. And it was quite tough. Like we, we, we tried like Sarah Ledge. We tried, you know, Mimikyu and stuff like this. But, like, it doesn't matter if they're just going to get outsped and KO'd. So we're like, okay, we're going to run the same Pokemon, but they're going to be bulkier. Okay. That's, like, the thought process <laughs> behind it. And so far, it's been working. It definitely has been working. And I hear you say the word we a lot. So just for my last kind of question, is there anyone you want to give a shout-out to? It sounds like you've been team building with a lot of great friends as well. So here's your moment to kind of give them a shout-out. Uh, honestly, there are so many, but... Um, Big shout outs to Fais, um, who's running the same team. Um, big shout outs to Krebs, who's always helping me out. Big shout outs to um, Ragav and NJ, who helped, with the, uh, helped me a lot with uh, the team, especially Ragav's concept. Um, we were kind of desperate, and he was OK. I got you. And he had the Torgal uh, idea. So um, big shout outs to him. And yeah, all my friends, family, love you all. Brilliant. Well, you've heard it here first. One top tip is to run bulky Pokemon. That's a really, really good bit of advice for up and coming trainers. It is now the lunch break, so of course we will let you go and have some food to get some energy up for the rest of the tournament. But we have held another match, so we will still be able to bring you another round three match very soon. So don't go anywhere, Pokemon trainers. We'll be back very shortly.